So I normally don't like to brag, <laughs> but uh, I was a germaphobe way before it was cool. <laughs> I, I was washing my hands multiple times a day way before the pandemic. And uh, you might think as um, someone with a severe case of obsessive compulsive disorder, which manifests mostly in severe germaphobia, that the pandemic might have been difficult for me. Um, actually, I felt pretty fucking good about it. It, it was, <laughs> I felt vindicated. <laughs> I told you guys, <laughs> wash your fucking hands. <laughs> and I, you know, and I felt good. I felt, I felt empowered. I, I was watching all the newbie germaphobes running around, <laughs> buying disinfectant wipes and and, and, and learning to sing the alphabet song to know they've washed their hands long enough. Like, I hum the entirety of Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker Suite. Twice. I mean, that's not all washing. I start rinsing about the second time the sugar plum fairy, fairy comes around. But, uh, but uh, you know, having obsessive compulsive disorder, um, it's not all fun and being victorious. It's a lot of it. But uh, in my mid-20s, uh, things had gotten pretty bad. I was washing my hands uh, about 100 times a day, maybe more. They were raw, chapped, and bloody. I was pretty much housebound, um, and I'd been put on disability. Uh, I found out about an OCD clinic in Philadelphia, and they specialized in exposure and response prevention therapy, and they had a five-week OCD boot camp. And I thought, I got to get out of this hole. I want to get back to living. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to sign up. And so I packed my bags, and I moved down to Philadelphia for the summer. So the first day, uh, I'm at the clinic, and I'm filling out intake forms in the lobby. And there's a woman sitting across from me doing the same thing. And she's beautiful. And she has long, strawberry blonde hair and sparkling blue eyes. And uh, I, I want to talk to her, but I also have a fear of flirting. It's not, it's not as bad as the germophobia, but it's, it's there. It's legit. So I, I, I think, you know what, this is going to be the summer I face all my fears. So I say, hey, um, what you in for? So uh, her OCD was not like mine. She had a severe fear of anything to do with death. So if she saw a gravestone or drove by a hospital, or even heard the word death, it would send her into a spiral of ritualized compulsions trying to undo her thoughts. Uh, she also had a fear that she might suddenly become morbidly obese if she came into contact with someone morbidly obese. She saw you could catch it like catching a cold. I mean, she knew that wasn't how it worked, but that's how she felt, and she was embarrassed telling me that, and I I told her it's okay, I, I get it, I, I have these irrational behaviors and thoughts myself, and pretty soon we're swapping OCD stories, comparing notes and laughing and having a great time, and her name's Heidi, she's, she's from Canada, she's an artist, she's witty, she's charming, I feel like we're really connecting, and I want to ask her out, but I'm, I'm afraid, I'm, I'm afraid she'll say no, I'm, a, I'm afraid I'm not worthy of her. I'm, I'm afraid it's inappropriate, like we've just met. And I ultimately decide, yeah, I'll, I'll wait. Maybe wait a couple weeks, and maybe there'll be a better time to ask her out. Later that day, I meet my therapist, uh, Dr. Kozak, and he's all business, and he gets, gets right to it. And he says, okay, Steve, uh, you're a germaphobe. What are you afraid of touching? And I said, well, my shoes, for one thing. Why your shoes? Well, your shoes are in constant contact with the ground, and on the ground, you can sometimes find garbage, you can find feces, you can find used condoms. And Dr. K says, okay, uh, by the end of this program, we're going to be touching all those things. And I'm like, hold up. <laughs> not what I signed up for. I, I'll be happy if I can tie my shoes and not be a traumatic event. And so anyway, we get right to it, and we go out into the hot, muggy Philadelphia summer, and... Pretty soon, Dr. K's got me picking up discarded wrappers and old wadded up tissues off the ground, and he has me putting them in my pockets. I should mention, uh, during the entire five weeks, I'm not allowed to wash. I'm not allowed to wash my hands for five weeks. I'm allowed one five-minute shower once every four days. 
This is the only time I'm allowed to come in contact with water. I should also mention that uh, a bigger fear than getting germs myself is I have a fear that I'll unknowingly pass those germs to other people. So to address that, uh, what we'll be doing is once my hands feel sufficiently dirty and gross, we'll be going to markets around Philadelphia where I'll handle all the fresh fruit that I know other people will be buying and eating without washing. So uh, remarkably, this is pretty effective, this program, because after two weeks, Dr. K's got me uh, comfortably touching dog shit. And, and one day I'm, I'm in the park and I'm touching dog shit and I'm impressed with myself and I'm like, you know, maybe I am worthy of Heidi. And, it, <laughs> and so, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask her out. So I, at the end of the day, I march back into the clinic, I'm gonna ask Heidi out and, I, and she's there in the lobby and I'm, I'm fired up and, but she looks pale and shaken and I'm like, are you doing okay? And she said, not so much. And, they had taken her to a cemetery to confront her death fear and had her lie on a freshly like dug plot. And then they took her to a mall um, to hug morbidly obese people. And part of me is thinking, you know, if she doesn't get better as a skinny guy, maybe this morbidly obese fear could play to my favor. I'm, I'm not proud of that. I, regardless, it was a bad time. It was a bad time to ask her out, clearly. Like, I'm not gonna ask her out now. I'll, I'll wait a couple weeks and maybe she'll be doing better. So by the, by the fifth week, by the last week of the program, I'm kicking ass. Dr. K's got me like going in public restrooms, dipping my hand into toilet water, <laughs> coming out, shaking hands with strangers, <laughs> going to the market. One day we're going to the market to touch all the fruit and we pass a, uh, a porn shop and Dr. Kozak senses a a potential for some good therapy. So he says, let's go in the porn shop. I'm like, okay, so we go in the porn shop and against the wall there's a bank of uh, video booths. And so I go into the video booth and I close the door behind me and it's dark, but I can see there's a box of tissues on a shelf and there's, there's a screen where the video plays and a slot where you feed your quarters where you get your, you know, porn at 30 seconds a pop. And gentlemen, you know, use these facilities to blow through their quarters or, you know, they, they do their business in there. And so um, Dr. Kozak's on the other side of the door barking out instructions. He's like, okay, Steve, I want you to uh, touch the screen. And I touch the screen, touch the coin slot, touch the coin slot. Uh, other patrons don't seem to mind that there's one man yelling at another man <laughs> to touch things. I don't know if like this is Dr. K's spot but I'm doing everything, and then he says, okay, Steve, touch the wall, and it's dimly lit, but I can see streaks on the wall. So I touch the wall, and then Dr. K shouts out the instruction I was hoping he wouldn't. He said, Steve, I want you to touch the floor. And I look down, and it's just darkness. I can't even see the floor. And, and, and I look down, and this is my Mount Everest. I take a deep breath and I, and I bend down and I place my hands on the floor and as I'm peeling them off, <laughs> I hear Dr. Kozak say, okay, let's go to the market. <laughs> so we go to the market on the way to the market, touch some dog shit for good measure, get to the market, you know, I'm feeling all the plums and peaches and apples and pears, and it's around lunchtime, so people are coming in to grab their fruit. And Dr. K says, why don't you grab an apple for yourself? And I'm like, okay, I guess that's part of the deal. So I get an apple, I'm like, you want one? He's like, not after you touched it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, funny guy, how many patients do you say that to? So, I mean, we're walking home, I'm eating my apple, and I'm feeling like invincible. I am fearless, I am all powerful and I am gonna ask Heidi out. I don't care what the situation is. I am asking her out, and I finish the apple, and I put that core in my pocket with the rest of the garbage, and I march into the clinic, and I look around, and I don't see Heidi where she usually is, and, and I walk up to the receptionist, and I say, excuse me, if, if, have you seen Heidi? And the receptionist, receptionist says, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Heidi, uh, she checked out of the program early. She really wasn't doing well with it, 
and she decided to go back to Canada, and she didn't leave any forwarding information. Yeah. And I, I often think, like, what that could have been like that those five weeks uh, if I had dated Heidi. But I learned something that summer. Actually, I learned two things. And, and the main thing is, um, you know, if you really like someone, don't wait for the perfect time because it'll never happen. And the second thing I learned is, for God's sake, wash your fruit before you eat it. <laughs> Steve White, everyone. <laughs>